Thunder. Tier 1 is a real-time tactical game played from an isometric perspective. Its strengths are virtually perfect animation system and the realistic sandbox gameplay possibilities. However, the game also has defects which diminish the game, incompetent AI, and the mission design not exploiting the sandbox potential. I would like to start with the animation system in Thunder Tier 1. I think it's the best animation system of any tactical shoot on the market. Allow me to show you. Okay, first, um, if you use your mouse pointer, I see a character is looking where the mouse pointer is looking at. Which is not particularly special, many games do that. But pay attention how, how it's animated. Notice the head is almost directly, instantly following it, as long as you're in a 180 degree angle in front of the character. Notice how much slower the torso is twisting and the shoulders and the hips. Notice that. I haven't seen another game where it's this realistic, the way the character turns around. And it looks even cooler when you're walking. Okay, so walking like this. Left, right. You can even look behind you as you're walking. And now notice the difference when he's looking on his left side. Notice on the left side, he, he's not turning as much because he's a right-handed shooter, so it's easier for him to turn to the right side. I'm to show you in this direction again. <clears throat> Looking like this. Looking at this again. And it gets even cooler when you look at how the weapons are handled. <clears throat> okay, let me get a good camera angle over here. Notice what happens when the character is aiming down the sides. So I'm holding right mouse. Notice he's raising the weapon like in other games. Now what's different here is that notice when he's raising the weapon, <clears throat> he's raising it really fast. And then only after that, there's a delay before he's pushed it into the shoulder where the head is leaning into the weapon to get a side picture. In most other games, they just give you the end animation state of the character being in aim, aim position and the game just blends into the position. But you see here, it's sequenced. First he's raising the weapon and then a short moment after that he's leaning into it. And when you let go of it, notice how much slower it is than raising it. See the difference? Because in real life you would lower it slower than you would raise it in most situations when you're relaxing. And there's one other cool detail. I probably have to zoom in into the post-production so you can see it. Notice what the, the leading hand is doing as he relaxes the grip. And you see it. It's a bit hard to spot. His hand is actually letting go of the grip and staying more, more tilted, more upward, instead of just being glued to the grip and the wrist pointing downwards with it, like most other games do, because it's easier to animate. And they actually went to extra step of relaxing the grip as he's lowering the weapon. And I think I only saw one other game that has the same detail. I think it was Days Gone, the zombie game with the bikers. <clears throat> and in that game, if you hold an M249 machine gun and you go into a prone, uh, not prone, into a duck position, he does the same thing. Like a guitar player, he would basically relax the grip on the right hand and the palm would rotate. But it gets even better. So if you want to, for example, you want to do point shooting or hip shooting, as it is referred to, you just left click. Notice he's not immediately shooting. He's just readying the weapon to shoot. Clicking. And for two seconds, the weapon is ready for, for shooting. I think it's a really cool detail because the game gives you like a window of raiding the weapon for two seconds and then you can hip shoot if you want. In this case it's point shooting, not really hip shooting. Because it's still in the shoulder but it's not really aligning to a side picture. And the cool thing is, notice the difference here. Hip shooting, aiming down side. Hip shooting, ADS. Notice there's a difference, it's not the same animation. And the animators went through that extra step of adding that extra detail instead of just using the same animation because I think most people wouldn't have noticed. This goes like that and then on side. And that's not all, it gets even cooler. Now when you switch to the pistol, you might get, need to get a better, better camera angle on this one. <clears throat> Notice the switching animation. Notice as he's switching to the pistol, he is letting go of the rifle. Now the cool thing is, notice the rifle is hanging off a sling, physically animated off a sling. 
and his left hand is basically his palm touching his, um, his chest so he doesn't get in the way and he's pulling out with the right hand. And that's, I think they mo capped that from professional shooters because it looks really realistic. See that here. And if you're running with your pistol, notice the, gu the gun is basically hanging off the sling. And the leading hand with the pistol is still sort of pointing forward uh, so it's safer for the shooter. He's not running with the right arm and swinging it like the, le like the left arm, which is not holding weapon. Yeah. <clears throat> and the cool thing is about the pistol animation is, notice again the same with the rifle. The right mouse, you hold to shoot. Notice as he is going away from the holding position, he's not just blending down into a low ready position, he's actually pushing it back into the chest, straight forward, and then going down. Again, what professional shooters like to do. Notice that. And you have the hip fire, oh, sorry, the point shooting. See, point shooting, aim on side. Point shooting, aim on side. And it gets even better. I hope you're still with me because I get really fascinated by animation. So let's say you are behind this um, car. Well, the first thing is, <clears throat> Notice as you're trying to turn, notice that... Now oh, we need to get a better angle here. Notice here, here. actually it's, it's a long rifle so it gets in the way. But that's not the cool thing here. The cool thing is, let's say you are at this hood of the car, you want to shoot in that direction, now you're aiming. I have to go a bit further. Okay, now, notice what's happening here. Huh? What's going on? Yeah. You see that? He's actually procedurally holding the weapon, no stock. I think it's called no stocking in American, in English, American English. He's basically holding the stock right, ne right above his shoulder. And he's lifting the weapon so it procedurally can fit over the, over the obstacle he's trying to shoot over, see? Even went for that extreme detail. And the same if you're doing it in stand, a standing position. Notice here, he's lifting the gun over the target like this. So he doesn't expose himself from cover. If you're a tactical gamer who likes a Cold War or post-Cold War setting, this game makes a very good first impression. It takes place in 1993 and the gear available is correct for the period. The arsenal includes many Cold War classics, such as the AKM, Makarov, AKS-74U, CAR-15, FN-4, M14, and AG-3. Weapons can get attachments like flashlights, lasers, and suppressors. Armor is realistic ballistic resistance, with most helmets being virtually useless except against the weakest pistol calibers. The selection here is not as vast as an Escape from Tarkov or Ghost Recon Breakpoint. Or it makes up for it with a more realistic ballistic modeling. Ballistics has a great depth, which might be surprising as this game was not advertised towards realism. Weapon muzzle velocities are realistic, so are penetration values. Penetration also appears to depend on the angle of impact. For example, a 9mm pistol might get stuck in a stack of pallets used as cover, while a high velocity 556 or a specialized armor piercing 9x39 will cut straight through it and the target behind it, and through plaster walls, doors, corrugated metal sheets, or smaller trees. This realism extends to how deadly weapons are. When played on the realism setting, most weapons kill with one or two shots to the body. Hit enemies unceremoniously slump into a ragdoll. This has a certain frightening realistic quality to it, as there is no exaggerated animations for character death. They just go from agitated to ceasing to exist and dropping on the ground, often in a pose echoing the last few seconds of the virtual character's existence. When combat starts, there's so much fire happening in a that in a few seconds that a careful sneaky approach can turn into 5 seconds of chaos with 10 to 15 corpses littering the battlefield. One long burst from a car 15 emptying the magazine of 30 can end a fight and the recall system adds to the realism. It is not exaggerated. 
And the aiming crosshair indicator shows a pretty nice approximation of the side picture, the characteristic various movements. Weapons can mount magnified scopes that look very nice with scope shadows. The map is a very cool feature. Instead of a classic map, the player switches to an UAV drone flying over the area, and circling it in realistic and slow fashion. The player can then use a mouse to click the different buttons and activate thermal optics. Controlling AI teammates is elegant and intuitive. They are context-sensitive systems that make it easy to order a friendly AI to move to a point, suppress an area, or plant a charge to reach a door. With all these things, this game is in theory a more tactical and realistic than EFT, Armor 3, or Squad. So where's the catch? I'll start with the worst problem, the staggeringly incompetent AI. It comes down to two issues. The AI is too stupid to react to player tactics. It engages in combat behaving like zombies with guns, and the mission design makes the AI cheat in certain situations. At first, when playing the game, you might get lost in all the tactical gameplay possibilities, dressing up like a stereotypical SAS operator with a gas mask and MP5 sneaking through the rain at night. And when combat starts, they just run at the player, often failing to use cover. They do use it if the area is littered with cover, however in more open areas they just run at the player while shooting. And this is what breaks the game. All the tactical options are lost when the player figures out to just grab an M249 with 100 or 200 round boxes and just spray paints the area with fire. It is realistic for the weapon to be very effective in combat like this, however the eye fails to adapt to this tactic. You can play every single mission on realistic settings without the eye teammates, by just running through the map like a Terminator spraying the enemy with 556 fire. And they only get the player if they are sending so many units that the player is called reloading. So the player might get the first 20 guys, or the 21st guy gets the player as he has to reload the weapon. What should happen is that the game AI makes a strategic decision that if it detects players using LMGs, it would barricade and not keep coming, so that the player would be pushed into situations where he cannot use the tactical superiority of the LMG. Adding to this, the mission design often spawns groups of AI who come pouring into the map from a cliff or fence. Like zombies, if you shoot the first guy, the others keep piling on. Then there's the incompetent AI for AI teammates. They often react to enemy fire too slowly, and they tend to run into the fire of the player. This gets especially infuriating in the crashed helicopter mission, where the player has to protect two NPCs, with enemies spawning from all directions, because friendly AI was not able to figure out from what side to take cover from. Also, the AI tends to cheat. In the crashed helicopter mission, the player eventually has to flee the area while carrying a friendly NPC. I have attempted many hiding spots to shake incoming enemy patrols, however they would always come homing into my location with great precision. Another negative point is how the potential for sandbox gameplay is not exploited by the mission design. The player can select from campaign missions and play them in various ways by changing difficulty settings and weather. However, most missions are highly choreographed set pieces that play out in the same way every time. The game can also be played in multiplayer PvP or co-op. PvP would be great because it has a tactical realism without the AI issues as all the units are players. However, there is another catch. Whenever a player is spotted in deathmatch, there's a bright red outline of the character's pose when he was spotted. So in the deep of night, when you tactically sneak through an alley, if you are spotted, by the game determining another player has you in his cone of vision, you light up in bright red. Which removes all the tactical subtleties of seeing something in the distance and not knowing if it was a player or not. 
the setting cannot be turned off in custom games either. Because the game decided for you that you saw something and it underlines it in bright red. If it was not for that and the stupid 10 minute time limit for matches, followed by two minute pause between matches, then PvP combat is surprisingly fun. As a realistic slow character movement and a realistic ballistic system create a very tense firefights that are a bit slower than what you would find in Call of Duty. It is a lot of quiet sneaking followed by sudden bursts of action that is over in a second. This is the tragedy of this game. Virtually perfect conditions for a tactical sandbox game, combined with disappointing AI and a mission design that fails to exploit the sandbox possibilities. At times it feels like playing a better Armor 3, however there is no mission editor and you only can play the campaign missions. If they would give players more ways to set up missions, remove the red highlights in PvP, and improve the AI so it doesn't behave like zombies with guns, then this would make for a very fine tactical game. Which I think leaves this game as a almost perfect military sandbox with the sand missing in that box. So what the developers should do is get that sand into the box and then it would be a really nice game because all the pieces are there. They just need to be connected by granular options for sandbox gameplay. 